Uh, oops. Now take note, God did not say he cared for China or he cared for India, okay? although both are populated uh, by then. But he said that this land you're going to possess, I care for it. Okay? So out of all the uh, different continents and all that, God zeroed in on this piece of real estate and said, I particularly care for this land. Okay? How much does he care for it? I mean, for me, for, you know, my inventions, I only check on updates now and then. But here we are looking at, here we are looking at God looking at this piece of real estate always. Okay, his eyes are always on it from the beginning of the year to the very end of the year. Okay, so for me, I check the inventions <laughs> once every uh, year or something like that. But here we're talking about God looking at his creation every day of the year. Okay, now, if God is so fond of this piece of real estate, uh, well, surely there are other uh, ways of expressing it. Okay, so uh, for this particular verse, we see that uh, Jerusalem shall be called the mountain of the Lord of hosts. Okay, now this particular uh, label does not uh, apply to say Mount Everest, although that's the tallest. Okay? It does not ap apply to the Alps, although they're the most scenic. Right, it applies only to uh, the mountain. Uh, that uh, Jerusalem sits on. Okay? Now, as you all know, everything that the Lord says belongs to him becomes consecrated, sacred. Okay? So in this case, we're told that it is the holy mountain. Alright? So that tells us that this mountain that Jerusalem sits on is God's property. Uh, now, Interesting thing about this verse is that it does not say Jerusalem is called the holy mountain. It's not is, it's shall. Okay, why so? Because it's a prophetic book. And uh, so here we find that yes, Jerusalem is a holy mountain, but it has not been labeled as such yet, but it will be labeled as such. It will be called as such. Another uh, verse from that uh, prophetic book, uh, Zechariah. Okay, Judah. Most of us would think that Judah is the inheritance of the Hebrews. No, here it is. Judah is God's inheritance. Okay. Okay, the land may have been allocated, but it is still God's inheritance. And because it belongs to God, it is holy land. Okay. Uh, just now, John was saying that uh, Mount Sinai is so holy, anybody touches it, dies immediately. Okay? Same for the ark. Uh, David was foolish enough to uh, bring the ark to Jerusalem on the cart, and somebody touches it, the child dies immediately. Okay? Uh, now, that is, of course, a commoner. How about priests? Okay? So, Aaron... Uh, I think my battery just ran out. Is the thing switched off? Not yeah, it's not charging. Oh. Alright, so, so how about priests? Uh, are they exempted from uh, this holiness, I think? Well, uh, Aaron's first two sons, okay? They were foolish enough to burn profane fire, and what happens? Immediately, the two were killed, okay? So that's how God viewed... That's how, uh, when God says it's holy, it is holy, right? Don't mess with it, okay? Now, of course, uh, that begs the question, what happens... So, okay, so we're talking about holy mountain, we're talking about holy land. What happens if the land is defiled? Since this is holy land, it belongs to God, he looks at it 
from 1st of January to 31st de de December. Of course, uh, there's not how the Hebrews uh, uh, label the calendar. But, uh, right, now, what happens if the land that God cares for and therefore is holy, what happens if it's defiled? Well, God said he will visit the punishment of the iniquity and the land will vomit out the inhabitants. Okay? Now, this is important because it establishes why the uh, Canaanites were evicted. Right? Actually, not evicted, but uh, eliminated, killed. Okay? Right? So, now, unless you think that uh, the Hebrews are exempted from this, no. God, in the same verse, says, you know, if this land is defiled, it will vomit out the current uh, inhabitants, the Canaanites. But if you defile it too, you will also get vomited out. Okay? Right, so, so we have established the land belongs to God. But how about this gift of the land? Okay? Didn't God promise that the land will be given? So if it's given, how can it still belong to God? Right? So let's have a look. Okay, so here we have go in and possess the land. Right? And uh, uh, we are told that the Lord swore. Okay? So it's not just, uh, oh, by the way, I want to give you this piece of land. No, God says, I swear that I will give you this piece of land. Okay? Um, for how long would the, uh, will this uh, promise uh, last? Well, the next verse. Sorry, something. Really? Oh, I see. Sorry. Uh, in that case, you need to get me back on Zoom. This reminds me of a story. It was actually published in the papers. There was a physics professor who went through a lesson on Zoom, and at the end of the lesson, he didn't realize that his slides were, uh, were not visible to the <coughs> Zoom students. Okay, so this part here about the uh, the land vomiting, I think you all didn't, didn't see this just now, did you? Or did you all see this first? No. Okay. So, uh, so here basically, when the land is defiled, uh, God says uh, the land will vomit out the inhabitants, and when the Hebrews, after entering the land, also defiles the land, God is not going to say, oh. You are holy people, chosen people. Uh, this thing about holiness doesn't apply to you. No, same statute. Okay, if the Hebrews, although being chosen by God to be special people, uh, they will also suffer the same consequences. The land will vomit them up. Okay. Right. So let's uh, look at this thing about the gift of the promised land. All right. So this one, uh, I don't have to belabor it. Uh, you all would have known about this. Okay, so how long is that uh, gift? Uh, well, it's basically an everlasting possession. Right, so how to square in everything? Okay, it is given as an everlasting possession and yet God says it is his land. Okay. Right, so, so you, oh yes, okay. Now, when the Hebrews entered the land, does God really think that uh, they will stay in that land forever? Okay, well, we have this verse. See, first of all, if you look at the first two verses, uh, it is God talking to the people. Okay, uh, 
he so uses the pronoun your, you, and so on. In the third verse, God is talking to Moses, not the people. Okay? So he's using the pronoun them. Right? So God tells Moses personally that he knows fully well that when God brings the Hebrews to the land, they will break the covenant. Okay? So God is fully aware that they will break the covenant. Okay? And uh, what happens? God will take possession of Judah. Alright? So, it has been gifted, yes, but God knows that they are going to default. So, in that case, the land reverts to its owner. In this case, divine owner. Alright? So, in this one here, we'll take possession again. Uh, it's uh, from a prophetic book. Okay? So, it's not that uh, God is going to be very picky every now and then he comes in and says, oh, I'm taking back the land. Right? So no, it is in the future. You will take possession of Judah. Right, so now coming back to this thing about vomiting the, in the Hebrews if they defile the land. Okay? So we already saw God knows fully well they will defile the land. Okay? So uh, God warns them if you do not carefully observe all the words, I will scatter you. Okay? I will deliver you to the plunderers. I will sell you to the enemies. Okay? Now, um, so basically we know from uh, Kings and Chronicles that uh, indeed they were sold. Okay? Now here we find that uh, Way before that, way before they uh, indeed uh, defiled the land, God already said to say in Deuteronomy, by the way, Deuteronomy uh, means that the people have not entered the land yet. Okay, it's only in the book of Joshua that the people entered the land. So in the book of Deuteronomy, God already told them, among these nations that you are going to be scattered, you will find no rest. Okay, now what does no rest mean? So, does it mean like, you know, our immigrants, uh, forefathers who come to Singapore, they come here penniless and there was no rest, they didn't rest on Sunday, to just basically to, to set up uh, uh, their lives, okay? No, in this case, no rest does not mean that, okay? No rest here says it means no peace, okay? When you enter a particular land that you've been scattered, there will be no peace and take a lot it is among those nations. Okay, so we and this here in this text here in blue is very telling. Even your life should hang in doubt. Okay, so not only is there no peace in the lands that you're going to be scattered, your own life will hang in doubt. Okay, and this verse rings true in lots of Pro, uh, pogroms, okay, Russian pogrom, German pogrom, of course, which results in the Holocaust, okay. So all these have been predicted, or rather forecast, because God doesn't predict, okay. All these have been forewarned, right. You are scattered out to all these lands, your life shall be in doubt, okay. Now let's look at this word anti-Semitism. It's very rife. Okay, uh, practically uh, every newspaper, every social media, they will use this term. Okay, uh, now I started off by saying I'm only looking at Bible verses. So uh, why am I talking about anti-Semitism? Well, because it's a term. Uh, well, first of all, this term is not in the Bible, but that doesn't mean we don't look at it. Okay, so for instance, the word Trinity is not in the Bible. Well, we still use it, all right? Uh, and the word Good Friday, uh, well, it's not in the Bible, okay? And yet we use it, right? So this term anti-Semitism, it is uh, in common currency. So let's just, uh, let me just look at it very, very briefly, okay? Um, it was uh, as stated in my qu one of my questions there. It was coined by a German uh, po uh, political agitator, and it was coined in 1873. Okay, so that's how uh, recent it is. It is not uh, uh, an 
ancient term. Okay, it's not an ancient term. Now, um, this uh, particular agitator, I'm not. Gonna, I know who he, he, what his name is, but I'm not going to put his name there because I'm not publicizing. Uh, I'm not his publicity agent, right? But nevertheless, I want to highlight the treatise that he wrote. Okay. By the way, prior to this particular treatise, he wrote other articles, but nobody paid heed to him. Okay. But it's only after he wrote this particular treatise, everybody woke up and read his treatise. And, uh, okay, right, so his, the title of his treatise has five words. Let's focus on the first three words, okay? I blanked out, the, uh, I put in a red box there, something of Jewism. Something of Jewism, okay? This political agitator who coined the term anti-Semitism. So what do you think is in the, the red box? What word did this German chap use in the red box? Sorry? Threats. Threats, okay. Rise of Jewism. Advancement. Advance, okay. Now advance. Okay, advance is not a negative word. Whereas other things like uh, deficiency of Jewism and all that, those will be negative words. Okay, but uh, it's interesting you use the word advance because let's look at what this German agitator actually used. He used victory. Okay, he used the word victory of Jewism. Here is a person who's trying to explain why there's so much uh, um, antagonism against the Jews. And in his treatise, which caught the attention uh, of the masses, he actually uses the word victory of Jewism, okay? So why is it all the Germans, oh yeah, by the way, the rest of his title is against uh, Germanism, okay? So his full title is Victory of Jewism Against uh, Germanism, right? Um, why not against uh, the rest of the world? Well, the Germans, they are always full of themselves, okay? They think themselves to be a superior race, okay? So their benchmark is themselves, right? No need to talk about Victory of Jewism against the French, <laughs> right? Basically, the Germans, <laughs> right? So now here we find that uh, uh, that's an interesting title for a treat a treatise that, like I said, caught the attention of the masses. Prior to this, he was a nobody. After that, he was a celebrated uh, chap who made the rounds and what. Okay. Right, so, so basically that gives us an idea of how all these persecutors view the Jews. Okay, right, so, so that's the end of what I have for this. Uh, so if we use his title, instead of anti-Semitism, it should be anti-Jewism. By the way, anti-Semitism is a, it's a totally uh, wrong word to use, okay? Because first of all, the Semitic people are basically uh, in, encompasses the whole Arabs as well, not just the Jews. Okay, he's targeting Jews, but he's coined a term that is inappropriate because uh, anti-Semitism suggests that it's anti-Arab. Okay, but no, uh, he was actually referring to anti-Jews. Okay, so by right he should have coined a term anti-Jewism, but probably if he did that, he won't become as famous because. It's not as catchy as anti-Semitism. Okay, so so much for digressing from the Bible. Let's go on to the Bible. Antagonism against his people. Okay, I won't use the word anti-Semitism. I won't use the word anti-Jewism. The more appropriate label is ant antagonism against God's people. Okay. Now here I deliberately say God's people because uh, although we are talking about Jews here, Jesus tells us that as Christians we are also going to be persecuted, okay? But that's a different uh, sermon. Uh, let's, uh, I won't go there yet. Right, so antagonism against his people. Did the pogroms only exist after the Romans sacked Jerusalem and all the Jews fled? No, the pogrom already um, uh, existed prior to that. Okay, so we... Uh, read from Acts, that's uh, Emperor Claudius, 
commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. Okay? The Jews were basically creating unrest. Okay? Now, uh, <coughs> like practically in every other place, you find that uh, um, the rulers are not going to uh, find out who the troublemakers are and then tell them to leave. Okay? Basically, the command is all Jews leave. Okay? So, uh, by the way, this verse is associated with uh, uh, Priscilla and uh, Aquila. They are obviously not going to be uh, troublemakers, okay? but uh, they had to obey this particular command. Okay? So we find that the attitude of the peoples of the different nations is that they treat the Jews en masse. Okay? So, for instance, Hitler. Right? Do you all know that Hitler, when in the First World War, actually served under a Jewish lieutenant or lieutenant. Okay? And that Jewish lieutenant actually recognized his contributions to the war and he recommended Hitler for a medal, the Iron Cross. And Hitler wore that medal throughout his career. Okay? So whilst he was Führer, he was wearing a medal that a uh, Jewish lieutenant uh, uh, wrote the paperwork for. Okay? And the rumor also has it that Hitler originally fell for a Jewish girl. Okay? But uh, that was rumor. Can't say. <laughs> so here, yeah, when the Hitler rose to power, okay, did he say, oh, let's look at those Jews who are not contributing to the German cause? No. Basically, all Jews. Okay? All went to the concentration camps. Right? Right, so this one is biblical. How about the book of Esther? Okay. Now, for the book of Esther, most people think that, oh, it's because Mordecai didn't bow down to Haman. Okay? And uh, uh, by inference, if uh, King Ahasuerus did not elevate Haman to high office, the book of Esther would not even have been written. Okay? Because Haman was the one who wrote those decrees saying all the Jews will be killed on such and such a day, and hence Purim, uh, the festival of Purim. Okay? No, we find that Haman was just the, um, uh, the, the catalyst. Okay? We find that apart from Haman, there were lots of enemies of the Jews. Okay? And what were they trying to do? Okay? Even before Haman was elevated to high office, the enemies of the Jews were trying to overpower the Jews. Okay? So how many Jews, uh, sorry, how many enemies are we talking about? Okay? So the book of Esther tells us that the Jews actually killed 75,000 of the enemies. Okay? So that tells us that uh, it is not a one-man problem. It's not Mordecai versus Haman. Okay, it is a lot of Jew haters. And in this case, 75,000 of them got killed. That doesn't mean there are only 75,000 Jew haters, but uh, the Jews only targeted 75,000 because they are the ones who showed their fans. Okay? Right, so now, so that's Esther. How about uh, in the Pentateuch? Okay? During the Patriarch's time. Right, so let's have a look at this one here. Isaac was forced to move to Gerar because of a famine. Okay, so whilst he was there, God blessed him, right, because he had just moved there. So uh, obviously his crops and all that uh, had to be replanted, okay, and, all, and so on. So God blessed all his uh, uh, agricultural uh, endeavors. And guess what happened? The Philistines envied him. Okay, the Philistines envied him. And did they just say, oh yeah, uh, can't be helped, uh, God likes his people. Okay, no. The Philistines sent the king to tell him, to tell uh, uh, Isaac, go away, go away. Okay, we don't want you here. Alright, so we see that the antagonism against the Jews 
started even way during the patriarch times. Okay? It is not a modern phenomena. It's basically whomever God favors, the rest of the people instigated by Satan, is, they're going to hate them. Okay? So the same applies to us Christians. Jesus has already warned us, the moment we take on the badge of Christianity, the world will hate us. Okay? Right, so let's move on. Okay, now, um, of course, we know that the tribes uh, uh, were living in Canaan. They all got uh, uh, decimated. And then after that, of course, uh, we have other tribes. Now, let's look at uh, not the natives of Canaan. Okay, let's look at the relatives. We know that the natives are going to be hostile. Here is some strange people from Egypt wanting to take over your land. Of course, you'll be hostile. Okay, so even uh, talk, don't talk about antagonism against the Jews. If somebody steps on my territory and wants my house, I'm going to be hostile. Okay, so natives being hostile, yes, is a given. Now, how about the relatives of uh, the Israelites? Okay, how about the relatives of the Israelites? So we see, let's go according to seniority. Okay, Lot. Okay, Lot came with Abraham, or rather Abraham, down to the promised land. Okay, so he had two sons. Okay, uh, two, unfortunately, uh, um, <coughs> I mean the, okay, never mind. Uh, so we had two sons, Ebonites and Moabites, okay? Uh, you all know about the plot and his two daughters. Eh? Okay. So from those liaisons came Ammonites and Moabites. Right, so what is the charge against them? They refuse to offer you bread and water when you step out of Egypt. Okay. Now that doesn't seem too much of a crime. right? Uh, but then they are in the desert. They definitely need water. Okay. Maybe bread, yes, manna is coming down from heaven. Fine. The bread part is taken care of, but water is an essential. Okay, right now this doesn't look too bad, but if we look at it, okay, the same charge also lists this thing about the hired Balaam. Okay, just now during the sharing, somebody talked of Balaam. I think it was you. Right. Oh, okay, fine. Um, now, so the hired Balaam to curse the Hebrews. Now you may think, oh, curse, what's the big deal? But the Bible actually says that this Balaam is so powerful, whomever he cursed, those people are really cursed. Okay? So we're talking about the ultimate weapon, bringing the big guns, which is Balaam. Okay? Right? So how about Ishmael, the next uh, relative? I mean, in the, uh, in the order of descendancy. Okay? Ishmael was, of course, of Hagar. Okay, and uh, we find that here, uh, after Isaac was born and he was weaned, Abraham hold, held a, a large party. After all, this is his first son, in fact, he's old. Okay, uh, and, uh, um, and amid the celebrations, Sarah saw Ishmael scoffing. Okay, now again, you may think, what's the big deal about scoffing? Yeah? Young kids, I mean, they can't take this uh, behavior seriously. But here we're not talking about a five-year-old. Do you all know how old is Ishmael at this time? No, 15 years old. Okay? He is 15 years old now. He knows what on earth is happening. He knows that his favorite status, prior to the birth of Isaac, he was basking in his father's, as well as probably Sarah's uh, adulation. Okay? But suddenly here comes Isaac. And he's scoffing. And did that scoffing, was that scoffing a temporary sort of thing? No, we find that right now his descendants are still scoffing. Okay? Right? By the way, the, his descendants include all the Muslims. All right? Uh, Muhammad uh, claims to have descended from Ishmael. Okay? And a lot of Arabs also claim they have descended from Ishmael. All right? Right, so uh, then here we have uh, another uh, relative, okay? And here the charge is uh, very serious. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar had sacked 
the city of Jerusalem, and some of the Jews uh, escaped. Okay? Now, this particular relative, or rather his descendants, actually stood at a crossroads, prevented the escapees from uh, leaving town, and actually we sent the es escapees back to Nebuchadnezzar. Okay? Now, in this case, it is uh, in the first two verses, we have Ammonites and Moabites identified. After the second verse, we have Ishmael identified. Here is just you. Who on earth do you think is the you? A clue will be the author of the book, Obadiah. Who did uh, Obadiah rail against? Edomites. Okay, yes. Okay, these were the Edomites, right? The whole book of, actually, Obadiah has only one chapter, right? So when I say the whole book, it's literally the whole book. Okay, so the whole, whole chapter or the whole book of Obadiah is railing against Obad, uh, 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 the Edomites. Okay, so here Edom is a twin brother, or Esau, okay? Before he got his name Edom, uh, he was originally Esau. Esau was a twin brother, okay? very close relative. Lot's kids may be you know, further away. Ishmael, well, he's a half-brother. That doesn't count. Here we have a twin brother, okay? And uh, they are cutting out Jews and sending them back to King Nebuchadnezzar, all right? Now, this one here, Amalekites, very famous, even the... Uh, Prime Minister of uh, Israel uh, talks about him, them. Okay? Where are the Amalekites from? Were they natives? Who were naturally hostile? Okay? Well, since it is under the label neighboring relatives, definitely they are not the original natives. Okay? They are relatives. And this relative we're talking about, uh, again, Esau, twin brother. Okay, Esau's son Eliphaz, he has a concubine. Okay, the concubine gave birth to Amalek. Okay, so Amalek is also a relative, but of course you can say concubine uh, not that close. Okay, right? It's not so legitimate. Okay, but nevertheless, relative. How about Midianites? Okay. Here we see that the Midianites caused Israel to be greatly impoverished okay, because of their plundering rates and they came in as numerous as locusts. Okay. So Midianites, again, uh, <coughs> most people think that they are the natives of the land. No, we find that Midian is actually... Abraham's legitimate son. Okay? Just now, I said that Isaac was Abraham's first son. Okay, first legitimate son. I did not say Isaac was Abraham's only son. Okay? Because Abraham actually married this lady. Okay? And this lady is very productive. Okay? So definitely... Abraham was not infertile. The problem is with Sarah. Okay? Because when he married this lady, pop out so many kids. Okay? And these kids cause trouble. And uh, historians say these kids are also the ancestors of the Arabs. Alright? So the Arabs either, well, they claim that they descended from Ishmael. Okay? Because Ishmael is the first son. And first son has firstborn rights. Okay? But, uh, uh, well, uh, some may be able to trace their ancestry through uh, uh, Keturah as well. Okay, now, how about the Philistines? There's so much talk about the Philistines. The Palestinians claim uh, to be buddy-buddy descendants from the Philistines. Okay, so are the claims legitimate? Well, let's have a look. First of all, are the Philistines natives? To Canaan, because the Palestinians claim 
They descended from Philistines, and the Philistines were native to the land. Okay? Well, the Bible. Oh, yeah, first of all, uh, let's trace from the Bible uh, where did the Philistines come from? Okay? Um, now, um, just now I've already talked about uh, 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 the word uh, Semites. Semites means that the people descended from Shem. Okay? Uh, in this case, the Philistines did not descend from Shem. Instead, they descended from uh, Ham. Okay? They descended from Ham. Um, now, Ham has four sons. Okay? First son is Cush. Cush is famous because his son is famous, Nimrod. Alright? Next son is this one, Mizrem. Okay? Third son is Put. Not so famous. Turns out that they ended up in North Africa. Fourth son is very famous, Canaan. Okay? Because uh, 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 in the flood narrative, we are told Ham, father of Canaan. It's not Ham, father of Cush, who is the firstborn. It is Ham, father of Canaan. And whom did Noah curse? Not the first son, but Canaan, the last son. Okay? So Canaan gave birth to a lot, I mean, not that he gave birth, but uh, uh, descended from him are uh, all these nations. Okay? Jebusites, Amorites, Gigashites, Hevites, and so on. Okay? Now, uh, when the Hebrews were about to enter the land, God told them, in this promised land, there are seven nations more powerful than you. Okay? The names that are listed are identified by God to be nations that are more powerful than you. Okay? So we find the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Parasites, and so on, right? They are all family members. So most people, when they see this verse, oh, Philistines from Ham, they will assume that the Philistines also live among the Canaanites, okay? meaning that they are natives. Right? Because Canaan, of course, live in the promised land. And by inference from a verse like this, the Philistines also live there. But the Bible says no. The Bible says the Philistines came from Kephor. Kephor is an ancient name for Crete. Okay? Right? So that establishes that the Palestinians claim that the Philistines, their ancestors, were native to the land and therefore had right to the land, okay, that is, uh, should be debunked, okay, because God says the Philistines came from Kephor, right? Now, this verse is very interesting. This verse is from God. God said that, okay, did I not bring up Israel from Egypt? Yes, all, all of us know that. But God also says, did I not bring up the Philistines from Kephor? Okay, right? So we find that all the migration of the ancient peoples were actually uh, prompted by God. Okay? Now, the interesting thing, if you look at the historians, they could not identify or they could not uh, fathom why did the Philistines leave uh, Crete or Kephor. Okay? There was no earthquake, there was no pandemic, uh, the, there was no uh, rival tribe that came down to conquer them and dispossess them of Crete. Okay? But suddenly they just all went via the sea and became known as the sea people. Right? Okay, so <laughs> this verse tells us the emigration of the, 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 the Philistines from Crete was actually prompted by God. Okay? Interesting. I will bring this up later when we're talking about uh, uh, 1948. I mean, the question that has the word 1948. Right, so the, uh, the Philistines emigrated from uh, Crete. Where did they reside in the, in the Canaan area, in the Promised Land? Well, again, 
Bible tells us the fact that they live on the sea coast. Okay, they live on the sea coast. And uh, the Bible for this verse also tells us that uh, these people on the sea coast, they were not originally there. Okay, they were from the nation of the Cherutites. Again, another ancient term for Crete, uh, people in Crete. Okay, so twice as stated, they are not native to the land, although they are related to Canaan. Okay, they are not native to the land. Some strange reason they uh, uh, they settled in Crete. Okay, and then uh, emigrated. Okay, now so we are we the Bible tells us where they came from. The Bible tells us where they settled on. Okay, did the Bible tell us when they turned up? Okay. Well, the Bible didn't say a particular date, but here we find Abraham stayed with the Philistines many days. Okay? So that tells us that uh, way before the Hebrews entered the Promised Land, during the Patriarch times, the Philistines were already there. Okay? Right, so now, Philistines against Israelites. Okay? Philistines against Israelites. Um, the uh, Palestinians, as well as all their supporters, would uh, claim that uh, you know, you Jews came in to the Promised Land, and you killed all the Philistines, and you took over their land, or rather, you dispossessed the Philistines of the land. Well, let's have a look at what the Bible says. This is at the time of Joshua, or rather, when Joshua was very old. Okay, so God told Joshua, uh, yes, I recognize you're very old, uh, but uh, please note, there still remains a lot of land still not possessed. Okay, and God actually lists all the territories. Right, and the very first in that list is all the territory of the Philistines. Okay, so in the book of Judges, uh, sorry, in the book of Joshua, the Philistines were not dispossessed of the land. Okay, in the book of Joshua, there was no conquest of the Philistines. They were still living there, right? Now that's the book of, then we find that the Philistines at one time actually ruled over Israel. Okay, right, so now uh, the word given there is the Philistines ruled over Israel then, right? So not all the time, but then, okay? Um, <coughs> because during the book of Judges, you find that various kings rule over Israel. Okay, the first one was uh, King of Mesopotamia. Kind of funny, but uh, Mesopotamia is so far away from Israel. I mean, Abraham walked all the way from Mesopotamia to the Promised Land, and here the first king uh, in the book of Judges to rule uh, Israel is the King of Mesopotamia. Okay, right. So, um, uh, so after that. Uh, uh, the people uh, 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 suffered, of course. Uh, they were moaned to God. God sends judges. Okay? And during the Philistines' time, the judge is, of course, Samson. Right? Okay, so this is another very famous incident. The Philistines fought. Israel was defeated. Okay? So here it's stated Israel did not wipe out the Philistines. Instead, they were defeated. Okay? And how embarrassing was it? The Ark of God was captured. Okay? So, if we look at these three verses, we find that in the book of Joshua, in the book of Judges, in the book of 1 Samuel, three books, all in chronological order, in this timeline, the Philistines were not subdued. Okay? And of course, in the book of 1 Samuel, we knew that the Philistines actually killed the first king of Israel. King Saul, as well as Jonathan and his brothers. Okay? So the Philistines were not vanquished. The Palestinians claim that the Philistines were eliminated at the first go. No, we find that even up to King Saul, Philistines were in full control. Okay? 
Now this last verse is interesting. How do the Philistines operate? Here we find that while Samuel was offering a sacrifice, the Philistines attacked. Okay? Is that reminiscent of modern day? Yom Kippur. For Yom Kippur, the Jews had a 25-hour fast. Okay? They were, of course, in no uh, physical state to fight. And yet, all the nations attacked the Jews on Yom Kippur. Okay? Uh, most vulnerable period. Same here. Samuel was offering a sacrifice. Nobody was uh, holding their arms, their weapons. Okay? And the uh, Philistines took the opportunity to attack. Okay. Right, now why is it the Philistines were not defeated? Okay. Well, the Bible tells us they had chariots. All the inhabitants of Canaan did not have chariots. Okay. The only country with chariots is Egypt, because we're told that uh, Joseph rode on the Pharaoh's chariot. Okay. Right, so now, not just chariots, because you can have a chariot that's made of, I, uh, made of wood. Here we have chariots of iron. Okay, chariots of iron. The famous giant who was in Philistine's army, he wore a bronze helmet, he wore a coat of mail, he wore bronze armor and all that. Were the uh, Israelites similarly equipped? No. Okay? David, when he wanted to fight Goliath, what did King Saul do? Here, try my armor. Okay? The armor couldn't fit because the Bible tells us Saul was very tall. By the way, the Bible also tells us Saul was very handsome. So, okay? So handsome and tall. Right? Uh, now, of course, if he's tall, his armor won't fit David. Right? So, did uh, Saul then say, okay, one of you soldiers give up your armor, uh, let uh, David wear? No. Why? Because there was not all the soldiers had armor. Okay? And in this case, we can probably infer that King Saul was the only one with armor. Right? And since his uh, tall stature means his armor cannot fit David, and David said, I don't wear your armor. Okay? Right, so now, that's armor. Okay? Uh, how about weapons? Here we are told that uh, only Saul and Jonathan had metallic swords. Okay? Nobody else in the Israelite army had any metallic swords. Okay? So why is this so? Because basically there was no blacksmith in Israel. Okay? Then how on earth did the Philistines have chariots of iron and armor of bronze and all that? Very simple. They emigrated with their technology. Okay? This technology was only developed in certain countries. Egypt had them. Crete obviously had them. Okay? So when they emigrated, they brought the technology. Okay? So this is already a very telltale sign that the Philistines were not native to the promised land. Okay? By the way, another telltale sign is the way the Philistines fought. Here, we, in the, 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 the David's case, David versus Goliath, we find that the Philistines have this habit, you know, custom rather. Let's not all fight. I send out my champion, you send out your champion, they fight. Whatever the outcome, that's it. Okay? So if uh, if you all had watched the movie Troy, that's how the Greeks fought. Each side sent a champion. Okay? Right? So in this case, we've uh, these are telltale signs that the Philistines were not from, uh, were not native uh, to the land. Okay? And they uh, were immigrants just like the Jews, or Hebrews. Okay? So if the uh, Palestines got the nerve to say that the ancestors, the Philistines, were originally living there for many centuries, and here comes the Hebrews charging in, dispossessing them of the land. Hoy, the Philistines were doing the same. They came from Crete. They occupied that uh, piece of land, okay, uh, the coastland, right? 
And by the way, uh, do you think the Philistines were just happy with a strip of land near them? No. The reason why there are so many battles is because the Philistines wanted to expand. Okay? That coastline, the bridgehead, if you are for the army, you know what the bridgehead is. Okay? They don't want to just stay at the bridgehead. They want to expand beyond the bridgehead. Okay? So like, for example, uh, uh, Operation Overlord, when the Allied army landed on the bridgehead, they quickly wanted to uh, move out of the bridgehead. Right? Same for the Philistines. They also wanted to do that. Okay? And with this superior technology, they thought they could win. And indeed, they did for uh, four books here. Okay? Uh, by the way, the Philistines also attacked the Egyptians. Okay? In fact, they, were, they attacked the Egyptians first before they decided to settle in uh, the Promised Land. Right? Uh, and the Egyptians actually, in the initial phase, Egyptians actually were losing. Okay? But of course, that was home country. Uh, uh, <coughs> uh, so the Egyptians got much, uh, mustered all the reserves on it, whereas the Philistines, they came by ships. They can't muster reserves. So eventually, the Philistines lost. But that tells us how aggressive the Philistines were looking for land to settle. Okay, So for the Palestinians to claim that... Uh, you dispossess an original owner? No, that's not true. The Philistines were in the same uh, boats okay, uh, as the Jew Hebrews. Both wanted land. Okay? So, of course, the Hebrews came via the land route, whereas the Philistines came via the sea route. Now, uh, from all those verses, you may think, oh, the Philistines kept on winning. Well, no. Uh, when David came in, okay, David was, of course, a godly king. Uh, God will, of course, protect uh, David. Okay? From David onwards, he kept on defeating the Philistines. And here, in Solomon's time, we find that the Philistines were subdued. Okay? They paid tribute and served Solomon, uh, uh, <coughs> not just for a short period, but all the days of Solomon's reign. Okay? So the Philistines recognized that David, with God's protection, cannot be defeated. And so when Solomon came, came along, they just remained subdued. Okay? No point fighting. These two men are protected by God, favored by God. Right? Uh, then, of course, once Solomon uh, died, all hell broke loose because the kingdom split into two, and the Philistines started attacking him. Okay? Uh, so, in this case, we are told another godly king, King Hezekiah, the Lord was with King Hezekiah, and the Lord helped King Hezekiah to drive the Philistines back as far as Gaza. Okay, Gaza is an ancient name, it's still being used today. Okay, uh, so here we see that the Philistines have gone beyond the bridgehead, because this verse tells us that uh, Hezekiah drew, drove them back all the way to Gaza. Okay? Another godly king, Uzziah. Alright? So here again, the Philistines uh, once again uh, attack, wanting more land. And uh, God had to help King Uzziah to uh, subdue them. Alright? Okay, so let's now move on to oh, prophecies. After this will be the first question. Now, do the Philistines still exist? Okay, the Palestinians claim ancestry, uh, the claim the uh, Philistines to be an ancestors. Well, we find that God said, "I will stretch out my hand against the Philistines and wreak great vengeance." Not just vengeance. Okay? We know of the verse that says, "Vengeance of mine." Here, God is saying, "Great vengeance." Okay, and. Uh, uh, and God will destroy the Philistines so that uh, there will be no more inhabitants. Okay? Now, no more inhabitants does not mean that, oh, how about those uh, uh, residue? Okay? Well, that's taken care of by another uh, prophet who says that even the remnant, even the remnant will be perished. Okay? So basically, the Palestinians claim that the Philistines, that they, uh, 
uh, that they descended from the Philistines, that has to be debunked because we're told here that the Philistines are wiped out. Okay? And the historians also verify that uh, after about the uh, 5th century BC, there were no more historical records of uh, what happened to the Philistines. Okay, now let's look at the questions. Right, as I said, these are FAQs, okay? Questions not designed by me. And uh, these questions also gain acceptance among Christians, okay? So I'll show you the original questions and I'll show you the supporting verses that the Christians provided to corroborate uh, these claims, okay? So will the current war lead to the end of the world as already forewarned by Jesus that you will hear wars and rumors of wars? Okay, so now we find that it's not Israel versus Hamas. Uh, US and UK are involved because of the Houthis attacking the Red Sea uh, merchant ships. Uh, and now we find that Europe was also passed a resolution that uh, uh, they want to be part of the action. Okay, so will that be the end of the world? Right, so let's have a look. What did Jesus say? Jesus tells us that we will hear of wars as well as rumor wars. But Jesus' advice in the blue text is, don't be troubled. Is the yellow text says, and it's not yet. Okay, so there will be wars. Don't worry, it's not the end yet. And in fact, Jesus also adds, these wars must happen. Okay? Jesus himself said that these wars must happen. Okay? Not that hopefully we won't have wars, but these wars must happen. Now, um, here we find that Jesus was talking to the disciples. He was not preaching to the masses. Okay? It was a select group. How select? Well, he was not talking to all 12 disciples. He was only talking to four disciples. Okay, and the four disciples are actually named in Mark. Okay, you can look them up. Right? Um, so that means that uh, all this um, <coughs> rumor mongering and all that, um, Jesus actually didn't want the people to be overly concerned about all this thing. Okay? So Jesus tells us that you don't, don't shred it up. Don't, don't shred on it. Okay? Uh, only the Father knows what's happening. Even the day is known only by the Father. Okay? So don't try to second guess. Don't try to uh, spread rumors and get overly concerned. Okay? Right? So he talked to the four disciples. And of course, after this is published in the gospel, everybody knows about it. Question two. Why is Israel still claiming the promised land to be theirs after having been scattered for two centuries? Okay, so these are what the activists are saying, as well as, of course, the Philistines. Okay, now, uh, like I said, Christians have also uh, embraced this line of thinking, and they provide the biblical verses to corroborate that line of thinking. Okay? They said that, yes, God made the covenant, but the covenant has been breached. Okay? We already saw in Deuteronomy, God already told Moses, when I bring these people in, they will break my covenant. Right? Now, in that case, we have to ask ourselves, what does the covenant say? Okay? What does the covenant say? Okay, so here we actually have details of the covenant because of I only uh, was zero in and that part is relevant to my uh, presentation. Okay, so what does the covenant say? The only condition is that every male child among you must be circumcised. Okay, the moment anybody is not circumcised, that chap is outside the covenant. That chap does not inherit the land. Okay? So as far as I know, the Jews are still circumcised. I mean, they still practice circumcision. Okay? Every child uh, on the eighth day gets circumcised. Okay? So that means 
that the Jews have basically complied with the government. Okay? So the claim that the Jews have breached the covenant should be debunked. All right? It's not true. I don't know whether you heard about it, but some people say that uh, the covenant is unilateral, unconditional. Okay? Well, we already saw there's a condition, but the condition is, easy, is, is still being fulfilled. Okay? Now, uh, so what is this thing about uh, some uh, people saying that the covenant is unilateral? Okay? Well, in that case, let's ask, how was this covenant made? All right? Now, during the sharing, uh, somebody was talking about this cutting of animals. Okay? Now, cutting of animals is actually part of the covenant making, the contract making. Okay? Nowadays, of course, you want to make a contract, you have a piece of paper, the lawyers are present, both parties sign. Okay? And in boys' time, you know what they did? Take out the slipper, <laughs> uh, send them. Right? But in the patriarch's time, no, they don't take out the sender. They actually perform this right. All right, okay. They take four animals. The four animals are actually listed, but uh, it's really irrelevant. Okay. Uh, so they take four animals, cut the animals into halves, put the animals opposite each other. I mean, the halves opposite each other, and the two parties of the covenant have to walk between the row of carcasses. Okay. The significance of the covenant is if I break covenant, let me be like the carcasses. Okay, so that's the significance of that. Now, right, so, so uh, as somebody have pointed out also, uh, who walked through the, through the uh, role of carcasses? It's God who walked through the role of carcasses, not Abraham. Okay? Abraham was uh, in deep sleep at, the, at that time. Okay? Even if he wanted to, he couldn't have walked because he was in deep sleep. Right? So God is the only one who walked through the carcass, between the carcasses and therefore we have the assertion that this covenant is unilateral. Okay? Abraham did not sign on like uh, you put your signature. Okay? He was asleep. Now the covenant was made with Abraham. But so uh, we keep on hearing, oh God, so made a promise to Abraham, uh, Isaac, and uh, Jacob. Okay, so let's have a look. First of all, um, um, <coughs> the psalmist here tells us that uh, although the covenant was made with Abraham, uh, God remembers it. Okay, so it's not valid only during the lifetime of Abraham. Okay, God remembers the covenant and will uh, observe it forever. To eternity, okay. Uh, and the other thing to note is, of course, uh, when God made a covenant at that time, Abraham was the name the chap. Later, God changed his name to Abraham, okay. Uh, but it doesn't matter; it's the same person. So whether it's with Abraham or Abraham, uh, still valid, right? Now, uh, back to my original question. You find that this verse tells us that God made a covenant with Abraham and the covenant can be broken, which, okay? So for instance, let's say right now, there are lots of uh, Israelites uh, who have become gay and uh, in fact, uh, Tel Aviv is the gay capital of the world. So let's say if the Israelites one of these days, hypothetically, decide let's all not get circumcised. Let's throw away this ancient rites of circumcision. In that case, they will have breached the covenant. Okay? But no, we find that God made a covenant with Abraham, but he made a vow, an oath, to Israel. So the oath cannot be broken. Okay? Covenant still may be broken if the Israelites decide one day, let's all throw away this custom of circumcision. Okay? In that case, straight away, the whole uh, nation of Israel forgoes the right to the land. Okay? But here, we find that it's reinforced by a vow. Okay? That vow has no condition. Okay? And how about Jacob? 
check out if you read uh, this verse. Um, you see the first two patriarchs, Abraham, you know, he had this faith all along. Isaac, well, Isaac is not that actively uh, vocal in saying, you know, I have faith. But nevertheless, he, he did display faith. And uh, God addressed them by saying, I give you a covenant, I give you an oath. Jacob, how? That man is born a deceiver. Okay? Already at birth, he was grabbing his twin brother. Uh, leg. Okay? So, uh, God cannot give an oath unilaterally to Jacob. Okay? Uh, Jacob came into the promise uh, later, after he became Isaac, uh, not Isaac, he became Israel, okay? But as uh, Jacob, he was not entitled to special favor, like uh, what Abraham and uh, uh, Isaac uh, had, okay? So, uh, so Jacob had to earn his strikes, and only after he became Isaac, that's, uh, uh, the, he, that he also received an oath. Okay, now we have uh, debunked that uh, rationale that was uh, provided by the Christians. Let's now go back to the original question. Why is Israel still claiming that the promised land after having been scattered for two centuries? Okay, well, we can all say they are prophecies. Okay? Ezekiel tells us God will gather you out of all these countries. But when the people were gathered from all the countries, some of the UN's officers were saying that, uh, yeah, okay, fine, uh, they all suffered uh, the Holocaust, they should have land, but not necessarily the plot of land in Canaan or uh, Palestine, uh, Palestine, okay? Let's find some other plot of land, right? But that is not what God wants. God wants, he gathers the people and they go back to the original plot land because that is God's land. Okay? Somewhere in Peruvia, not good because God had never cast his eyes on Peruvia. Okay? Another uh, famous prophecy, I will assemble you from all the countries where you have been scattered. Now, since the people have been scattered, they obviously had lost all the uh, legal documents or whatever they have to land ownership. Okay? So how can you come back and say, hey, I still own that land. It was given to me long ago. Okay? Here God says, I will give you the land again. Alright? It was given and it will be given. Okay? So that's kind of... Uh, 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 eliminates all those arguments, but that, that uh, you know, God gave you the land, but that problem is so long ago. Uh, you all have been scattered because you all have been uh, uh, such horrible people, okay? And uh, some people even say you've breached a covenant. How can you claim that uh, the covenant still applies? Well, fine. God gives another promise. I will give you the land again, okay? Right, next question. Is it morally acceptable for Israel to retaliate when attacked? And again, Christians come along to provide scriptural verses to support this line of thinking. Okay, so the first one is God is love. You know, since God is love, how come you Israelites are not practicing love? Okay? Why are you going to attack? And God is merciful, gracious, and long-suffering, right? So in that case, shouldn't you Israelites be long-suffering? After all, Jesus, I mean the Jews don't, be, don't uh, believe in Jesus, but even Jesus teaches that, you know, you got slapped on the left cheek, turn the right cheek to be slapped, okay? So with all these verses support uh, provided by Christians to both state, obviously the first thing we have to do is to debunk the supporting verses, okay? Are uh, the Christians indeed correct in saying that these verses uh, lend support to the claim or to the question, is it more uh, of uh, Israel retaliating?
Okay, so let's look at this uh, second one first because it's easier. Okay, that came from Exodus 34. So let's look at the entire verse. Yes, indeed, the entire verse says God is merciful, gracious, long-suffering, or keeping mercy for thousands, uh, forgiving iniquity and sin. Wow, all these wonderful things. Okay, how come the Israelites are not uh, paying heed to that? Well, at the end of this verse, God adds in, by no means is he going to clear the guilty. Okay, so this verse has been taken by Christians out of context. God did not say he will clear the guilty. He will punish the guilty. Okay, so Christians are wrong in taking Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 to 7 to support the activists. So now let's look at the other one. God is love. Okay, where does this verse come from? Well, it comes from this. Now let's look at the entire verse. Okay, the entire verse does not say God is love, full stop. He who abides in love abides in God, full stop. No, it's a continuous sentence. John, the author, wants to say God is love and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Okay? So, if somebody reading this sentence gets uh, picked by the blue text, God residing in uh, this person, in human beings, how is it so? So the blue text, will then, I mean, somebody reading the blue text will then go to the yellow text and say, oh, okay, fine, the blue text is because of the yellow text. And then the yellow text is, of course, because of the grey text. Okay? So, the word God is love, although that's true all the time, but John, when he wrote God is love, he's actually trying to lend support to the yellow text and the blue text. So, this entire verse is actually talking about he who abides in love. Okay? God is love, that is a given. And in fact, in one ch uh, John chapter 4, there are five verses about God's love. Okay? So John did not rely on verse 16 to communicate that God is love. The other verses already did that for him. So in that context, John brings in God is love to say, look at the yellow text. Okay? So in other words, for Christians to take John 4.16 and support the... Uh, the, 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 the question above, that's our question. Okay, now, uh, we know that uh, we're supposed to have supporting verses. Okay, if uh, one verse says that, uh, we must look for supporting verses. So the supporting verse is, the Lord preserves all who love him. Okay, now in this case, again, uh, it's important to read the whole verse, and we find that the wicked he will all destroy. Okay? So fine, God is love, but you find that the wicked, he will all destroy. Okay? Uh, I think I've taken too much time, so this will be the last question that I will dwell on. Right, the last aspect of the reasoning given by Christians to support this uh, thing is, uh, if you look at it, it is uh, New Testament. Okay, so a lot of Christians say, oh, I don't like Old Testament. You know, Old Testament got so angry all the time. Okay, I like New Testament. Oh, look at uh, Jesus came down, died for me, uh, even promised me a mansion, and he's going to build the mansion. Okay, right. Now, so in the New Testament, Jesus looks like a good guy all, all the way, right? But they fail to realize that was the first coming of Jesus. The second coming of Jesus is going to be the judge. Okay? He will be the judge. And he will be coming in his capacity as Lord, not as Son of Man. Okay? And here, yes, Jesus will declare war. Okay? Right? Old Testament, so many wars. New Testament also will have wars. Okay? But in this case, Jesus will not be using human soldiers. He will be using heavenly soldiers. Okay? Right, so this one will be the last 
Let's go back to the original question, okay? Minus all the supporting verses. Is it morally acceptable for Israel to retaliate when attacked? When Abraham heard the Lord was captured, straight away armed his servants and went in pursuit. Okay? So there is no such thing as, oh, I was attacked, uh, let me uh, be pacifist. Okay? Same thing here. When David was attacked, or rather, uh, when he was away from his village, uh, Ziklag. Ziklag was attacked. So in this case, it was God who tells David, pursue. Okay, it's God who tells David, pursue. Meaning, retaliate. And also, right now, we have the Israelites wanting to pursue all the way. Okay, all the way. Well, here, God tells David, go all the way. Okay, not just pursue, but recover all. Okay, so I think I've taken enough of your time and patience. Uh, I still got lots more questions, but uh, uh, I think I've already exhausted all your attention. Okay, right, thank you very much. If you have questions, please feel free to ask. No, I'm not coming in. Okay, so <laughs> right. This question three. Let's move on to question f uh, four. Now here it is retaliate when attacked. Okay, but when the Hebrews entered the land, they were not attacked. They went in to occupy. Okay, so it's a different kettle of fish altogether. Right, just now it was. Israel was attacked, should they retaliate? But here is Israel is not attacked, it's going in to uh, dispossess and occupy. Okay? Right now, what does God say? Okay? God says that it's not because of your righteousness that you're going in to possess the land. The reason God is sending the Hebrews to attack the land is because of that verse I showed way at the beginning, the land will vomit the inhabitants out. Okay? So here God is merely using the Hebrews as the Asian to vomit those people out. Okay? So the conquest of Canaan the first objective is God is executing punishment. Okay? They defile his holy land. The land that he looks at from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. Okay, they default the land. Now then you may say, why you can put the two together? Why can't you just dispose, uh, conquer the people and uh, not bring in the, 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 the Hebrews? Well, you can use other means. After all, God sent fire and brimstone on Solomon tomorrow. Okay, well, it's because in those days, in the, uh, earlier, the iniquity was not full. God is very merciful. He will punish them only if they've gone beyond the line. Right? After that, once they've gone beyond the line, there is no excuse for them. Okay? They have to be punished. Right? Now, the other thing about uh, being sacred, as your own, as an example pointed out, uh, uh, Aaron's two sons you know, offered profane fire, straight away got killed. No questions asked. Okay. Now, same here, Jericho. When Jericho is was to be attacked, what did God say? God says the city is doomed by the Lord. Doomed by the Lord. Okay? 
what is the meaning of doom by the Lord? Well, anything in that city becomes a curse. Achan was stupid enough to steal the cloth and some gold and silver. God says they are cursed. His whole family died. Okay? After that, what did Joshua do? Joshua burned the whole city down. Alright? And in case it was rebuilt, Joshua pronounced two curses. Whoever starts to rebuild Jericho, his first son dies. Whoever finishes rebuilding Jericho, his last son dies. Okay? So that is what is meant by doom by the Lord. Okay? So we're not talking about oh one tribe conquering in the other tribe's land and all that. We're talking about God designating this land as being doom. Okay? Then here we have this verse. The Lord your God has commanded. Now, the last time the Hebrews, or rather the first time the Hebrews reached the promised land, God commanded them to go in, fight, attack. What did they do? They said, no. Okay. Ten spies came back with negative reviews. No, we're not attacking. Okay. This time they are at the doorstep. God has commanded, if the Hebrews don't obey, I don't know what will happen, another 40 years in the desert. Okay. Right? So here we have a command, a divine command. If we don't do it, like I said, maybe another 40 years in the desert. Right? So now, the other way of looking at it is this. The Jews, or the Hebrews, when they entered the land, it was the tribes, the natives, that attacked them. Okay? It was the natives that attacked them. So, by right, the Jews were just acting in self defense. Okay? So, all the tribes, all the native tribes, attacked the Hebrews. The Hebrew was merely defending themselves. Okay? The only city that the Hebrews actually attacked is Jericho, because Jericho is a doomed city. Okay? Whereas all the other cities, you find that if you read the book of Joshua carefully, okay? So for instance, there's this king, he gathered the armies of all the other kings, saying, let's amass our armies and attack the Jews, or Hebrews, okay? So we find that it is the natives that attack uh, uh, the Hebrews and not vice versa. And of course, uh, there is only one, uh, and that uh, provided the justification for them to be utterly destroyed without mercy. Okay, so another verse that corroborates this uh, uh, assertion that I just made, there was not a city that made peace with uh, the Hebrews, except for Gibeon. Okay? The only city that recognized, wow, this God, I better not uh, fool around this God. Let me make peace. Okay? All other cities, no peace. I mean, didn't bother to make peace. Right, so now, for occupation, do the Hebrews always fight the war for the purpose of occupation? No. Here we have this example. David defeated Moab. Did he occupy Moab's territory? No. All that happens is the Moabites became servants and paid tribute. Okay. From Damascus, there were 22,000 Syrians that came to attack David. They would kill all of them. Did he then proceed to Damascus and occupy it? No. They became his servants and offered tribute. Same like the Philistines. I already showed you the verse. Okay? During King Solomon's time, the Philistines were subdued by David. Okay? Did uh, they go and occupy the land of the Philistines? No. They just paid tribute. Okay? 
Right, sir, now, clearing the land for occupation. Clearing the land for occupation. Okay, now, uh, for the Hebrews, uh, God had to help because God already told them before they step into the promised land, there are seven nations in there stronger than you. I have to help you. Okay? Did God uh, accord this privilege only to the Hebrews? No. God also accorded that privilege to Lot's descendants. Okay? Lot wanted to possess a piece of land. The land, unfortunately, had giants living there. God destroyed the giants before the children of Lot dwelt in that place. Okay? How about the children of Esau, twin brother of Jacob? I mean, God showed so, so much favor to uh, Jacob. The twin brother ought to have some favor as well. Same thing, the children of Edom wanted to occupy a particular, uh, uh, in this case, happened to be a territory of the Horites. God destroyed the Horites so that the children of Edom can occupy the land. And here we have this verse, this, the end of the verse that says, even to this day they're still staying, the, the uh, Edomites are still staying there. Okay? Right, so now, here we have uh, clearing the land for occupation by uh, Lot's descendants and by Esau's descendants. But here we're talking about a promised land. Okay? And we know that the promised land is sacred land, holy land. Okay? The proper word is holy land. So if the Jews, after having occupied the holy land, God had already warned, if you defile my land, this land will also vomit you out. Okay, so in this case, we find that indeed, uh, first of all, was the Northern Kingdom, okay, carried away from their own land to Assyria. And uh, for the Southern Kingdom, okay, uh, God sent the Chaldeans against Judah to destroy them in accordance with the word that he had spoken by the prophets. Okay, so all these are orchestrated by God. In the first verse, you see it is God who removed. Second verse, you see, is God who sent. Okay, it is not that by happenstance, the Assyrians were trying to uh, grow the empire, they went to attack. No, God told the Assyrians to attack this northern kingdom. And same for the Babylonians. It's not because the Babylonians wanted to consolidate the empire that they attacked. No, God sent the Babylonians. Okay, right, so next question. Why couldn't Israel coexist with the other resident tribes in the Promised Land? Okay, right, let's look at the key word here, coexist. Okay, now, what do we have? The land, the natives were all evil. Okay, if God allowed them to if God allowed the Hebrews to coexist with them, then God said the natives will teach you to do according to all their abominations. Okay? I can't stand those of abominations. How can you go in and live among them? Right? Now, supposing you say, oh, uh, the Hebrews can be very religious, you know, uh, go to the uh, temple every day, don't ever look at the pagans. Well, example of Lot. Lot is a righteous man. He has a righteous soul. But what happened when he stayed among Sodom, which was destroyed by fire and brimstone? Lot tormented his righteous soul from day to day. Okay? So even if you stay in the land and don't look at the pagans' activities and all that, okay, which is what Lot did, your soul will be tormented. Right? So the first verse is, you may copy them, you may assimilate the customs. The second verse is, even if you don't assimilate the customs, you get tormented. Okay, so that is why coexistence is not possible. Now, the tribes, okay, the other resident tribes, 
what if the tribes actually had righteous people? I mean the natives. So here we find God said, you know, if you can find ten righteous amongst all them, uh, I will not destroy, I, will, I will stop the fire and brimstone. Uh, just ten. Okay? Obviously that didn't happen. And then now this example is not from the same time period. We find that the Ninevites, okay, the Assyrians, according to historians, were very aggressive people. Okay? They kill as they go. And yet we find that after Jonah went and said 30 days uh, you'll be sacked, the people repented, and God said, Fine, you repented, I will not sack you. I mean, I will not raise the city. Okay? So if a particular tribe showed repentance, like the Gibeonites, they are spared. Okay? So amongst the whole of the natives in the promised land, only the Gibeonites were not slaughtered. Now, the tribes in the promised land. Okay? So let's look at this thing. What question is this? Question five. Sorry, I have to look for my notes. Okay, now, the land is promised to the Hebrews. But so we now, as Christians, are also children of Abraham. So is that promised land also extended to us? Well, we are told here, and this is a prophetic book, okay? Strangers will dwell among you, right? Find the Hebrews will be the first to occupy the land. But after the gospel message has been spread, and Christians who are non-Hebrews become uh, 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 become uh, children of Abraham, they are also entitled to the land. Okay, so uh, they will dwell in the land. And uh, now, strangers dwelling among you, you know that God had said in the Old Testament that you can't have children f uh, with other foreigners and all that. Here you find that uh, that prohibition is relaxed. Okay, so strangers can not only are welcome to reside in the land, they can start having children. Okay, so this one is also prophetic. Uh, many peoples and strong nations shall come. Right, so these are of course prophetic. All right, so now this one is a sensitive one, and it's my second last. Uh, why were children not spared? Okay, why were children not spared? First of all, let's put matters straight. God has said children will not be put to death for the sins of the fathers. Okay, children will not be put to death for the sins of the fathers. And yet God tells uh, uh, the Hebrews, go attack Amalek destroy everything, okay? Destroy all. Men, women, infants, nursing child, and all also includes the animals. Whole long list of animals. I just put oxen there. Okay? Right, now, then we have to ask ourselves a fundamental question. When we were born, were we sinless? Okay, so I got two verses. Here, the psalmist says, I was brought forth in iniquity. I was brought forth in iniquity. Okay, not that the mother sin was conceiving the child, but I was brought forth in iniquity. Okay, so in sin, my mother conceived me. And the next one is, the wicked are estranged from the womb. Okay, as soon as they are born, right? So, God already knows the child is born. He is wicked. God doesn't need to know 20 years later whether this child is going to be wicked. Okay? Right? So, from the womb, God knows. Now, how is it God can know? Well, He is God. 
E can for no. Okay, so this verse is used for uh, predestination, all right? But so let's apply this to the killing of the babies, uh, the, 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 the uh, wicked babies. God already foreknew, okay? So from the womb, God will know that this baby is going to be wicked, okay? And uh, right, so in this case, before I've, uh, okay, so from the womb, God knew, okay? And then the one, uh, before you're born, I already sanctified you, okay? Now, in this case, we're talking about Jeremiah. So before, oh yeah, right, so before God formed Jeremiah in the womb, before God formed Jeremiah in the womb, he was already ordained to be a prophet. Okay, so God knew the character of this person or this uh, fetus. And in this case, the fetus of Jeremiah has already been ordained way before birth to be a prophet. How about others? Cyrus. Cyrus is not a Hebrew. Does God also foreknow all these people? Okay, so Cyrus, okay, if you look at Cyrus, uh, he is in the prophetic book of Isaiah. Isaiah has a 40-year prophetic ministry. Okay, so let's take the last year of his ministry, which is uh, 700 BC. When did Cyrus appear on the scene? 600 BC. Okay, so we are talking about 100 years. Before Cyrus was even conceived by his mother, God already talked about Cyrus. Okay, and... Uh, so we have it here. I have even called you. Okay? His, his mother hasn't even thought of the, the name Cyrus. In fact, his mother wasn't even born. So before his mother thought of the name Cyrus, God already a hundred years later, earlier said that uh, this fetus will be called Cyrus. Okay? All right, last question. Was 1948 indeed the divinely ordained year for the Israelites to return to the promised land. Okay? And again, we have Christians providing verses to uh, add into the, uh, shall we say, discussion. Right, so after all, Jesus already warned twice in Revelation that these people in the end times, they claim to be the Jews, but they are not Jews. Okay. And this assessment came from Jesus, right? So let's look at these two verses, okay? Uh, one twice. So let's look at these two verses. Now the first verse is this. To the Shmurna Church, okay? Now the Shmurna Church is in fact one of the commended churches. Very few commended, uh, this one is commended. So the thing about the Jews and who are not Jews Jesus was telling them, you know, I know that you've been blasphemed by these people. These people claim to be Jews, but they're not Jews. Okay? Right? So God is not talking about the people residing in Jerusalem, uh, in uh, Israel. Okay? This verse is referring to those who are gonna blaspheme uh, the commanded the Shemana church. Okay, saying that yeah, there will be all these people, these evil people. These evil people claim to be Jews, but they're not. Okay, then the other one, same thing, Philadelphia Church. Okay, uh, also one of the commanded churches, but uh, not at the same level as Mirage. Mirage is, of course, higher level. Right, so this supporting verse should be debunked. Okay, this supporting verse does not talk about Jews living in Israel. They are talking about uh, dissenters who are attacking the churches, okay? Not the residents of Israel. Then the other supporting verse, which I was very surprised to hear, is this one here. Blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, then all Israel will be saved, okay? So uh, the Christians who bring up this verse say, hey, when the when Israel's come back, they're supposed to be all saved. But you look at them now, Tel Aviv as the uh, gay capital of the world. How can that be? Okay. So 
that brings to mind that uh, brings the question into mind. It's nineteen forty-eight, the divinely ordained year. Maybe it is. It's going to be another year. The God will bring in truly all the Jews that are all safe. Okay. Well, let's have a look at biblical verses. Right now, here we find Isaiah that says, "We we'll recover the remnant of his people." Now, here the word is remnant. God did not say that these will be safe people. These will be uh, Messianic Jews. Okay, God just say the remnant of the people will be recovered. And uh, now, of course, his people comprises two lots. Okay, northern kingdom, southern kingdom. So for northern kingdom, it is the outcast of Israel. For the southern kingdom, it is the dispersed of Judah. Neither case did God say only the Messianic Jews from the northern kingdom will come back and the Messianic Jews from the southern kingdom will come back. Okay, so that means that this Romans verse should not be applied. Anyway, this Romans verse, Paul, when he wrote this Romans verse, was not even talking about this. Okay, so it's totally misapplied. Right, so now that we've cast out the supporting verse, let's look at the original question. Was 1948 indeed the divinely ordained year for the... <coughs> For them to return okay so right so uh, the good news is this will be my last slide <laughs> uh, and thank you for your patience right so let's have a look at the first one okay who sanctioned the uh, Jews to come back the UN okay now the detractors will say you know the UN at that time they were sympathetic because of the Holocaust okay but not after that the UN membership expanded, there were other countries coming in. These other countries would have voted against that resolution. Okay? Well, in that case, we look to Paul, who says that there's no authority except from God. Okay? So the UN composition that existed at the time, that was ordained by God. Okay? So whatever the resolutions they pass, those resolutions are appointed by God. Okay? Then the last verse. Remember the verse I showed you where which says God actually prompted the Philistines to migrate and the historians couldn't discover why they migrated. Well, here we have the reason. It's not just the Philistines. Here we have a verse that says God predetermines, or rather God determines the pre-appointed times for every tribe on earth, or rather for every people on earth as well as God has determined the boundaries of their dwellings. Okay? So this powerful verse tells us that, uh, you know, you may have, it may have been a political decision, but behind that political, political decision was God prompting the decision to be made. And was the time correct? Was the year correct? Yes, because... X verse, the verse in X here says it's a pre-appointed time. Okay? Right, so that's it. End of my entire presentation. And thank you for your patience. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, uh, Professor Sweeping and uh, Professor Yo as well for uh, coming. Apologize, I couldn't be there in person. I got a little bit of a, a knee injury but um, uh, zoom, uh, zooming in from home here in Pasiris. Uh, so greetings to uh, the family at uh, Mount Sinai. And I think we have a, a Moses that has come among our midst to, to share some of the perspectives of, uh, of, um, of uh, uh, post-independence wars. Um, I think uh, I've been keeping Professor Yeo a little bit uh, uh, updated on the situation here in Geelong. Um, although we may not be in a fight for any uh, piece of land, but it is uh, a concern uh, concerning some space that has become available since your last visit to us, um, I think last year. Um, and uh, uh, it uh, uh, regarding this uh, former uh, lion dance troupe, 
that has uh, closed down next door, immediately opposite our unit um, at 173A. And uh, also the workers' quarters on 173B on the third floor. Uh, so um, a question that has arisen in, in our minds is uh, taking territory, more territory, or space and uh, consecrating that space for the Lord's use um, in this part of uh, Geelang, which has actually under, under, undergone quite a bit of transformation um, in the last, uh, well, since the days of uh, Gay World and Happy World Amusement Park. Uh, it's been a long transition. Um, and uh, since the 30s and the 40s before the war, um, I think it's it's really it's really appropriate, and I I'm not sure that Sui, uh, Sui Ping actually uh, was uh, um, had this in the background. Obviously not, but um, everywhere the kingdom goes, everywhere we go, the kingdom must go. And uh, he sent his disciples two by two every place that he was himself going to go. So Jesus himself wants to come uh, into the marketplace and the, and the foreign mission fields, even at home here, even next door. And uh, of course, Chinese New Year is upon us and uh, we uh, we do think of our relatives. I think it was uh, spoken of just now, uh, Israel's relatives and even enemies. And of course, when we come to the um, uh, the ethics of the New Testament, we have the uh, uh, injunction to love our enemies. Um, and uh, bringing that directly uh, applicable to our situation here in Geelong, we are uh, continuing uh, to look for partners that might be suitable uh, to partner with us. And um, uh, one of the, um, one of the, um, uh, a, a, uh, a, a group of fathers that have been praying here on Saturday mornings um, had expressed interest in establishing a base in Geelong as well. Um, so we are looking at the possibility uh, of uh, negotiating for that property. Of course, it's not sale, it's just rental. But um, it, it means a lot because I think um, uh, we do want to hold ground and we, we do want to take advantage of the strategic position that we are in, especially looking right now, it's just an open grass patch, but there are about five units about to be built immediately in front of our church, um, over 1,300 units, uh, HDB uh, units as well as a whole bunch of uh, developments by the riverside uh, hotels and others. So this, this, this piece of property, um, we, are, we are looking at 173, 175. There are enemies there. We've, in fact, it was most unexpected that the, the uh, uh, Lion Dance Troop would, would, actually, would actually close down. But um, going forward, I think, um, it's important to to recognize that we are in a war. We are in a battle. And um, um, perhaps at a, another time, I can actually share with you what Luke uh, Ritchie shared with me from Spokane, Washington. He sent he sent a, uh, a video in uh, regarding a, his outreach using technology and to the gaming world. And he came out with a very interesting spin on the wars of the Lord. Um, and he took one tribe, the tribe of Benjamin, and he actually created a, a, a scenario online uh, for global uh, gaming partners to actually um, reenact, as it were, a portion of the wars of the Lord as we read it in the Bible, um, exactly as uh, Professor uh, Yo had, had, has been uh, uh, explaining to us. Um, of course, uh, um, apart from the actual 
uh, ongoing conflict uh, in 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 the Holy Land. Um, these are parabolic. These are actually uh, didactic as well um, uh, for our own situation. Um, sometimes we we have to look at the situation that we're in and we have to interpret it carefully. Otherwise, we just uh, take the uh, media approach and, and we misinterpret things. Um, I think um, uh, there have been uh, several occasions where uh, we we really have to um, uh, pray for the gift of interpretation, that what we read, uh, what we hear. Um, I remember Chief Tarangi of the Maoris, he was given a prophecy. Uh, one day a man came into his church and says, oh, Chief, you know, I see all the tables and chairs overturned in your church and that your church is going to close down. And immediately the chief said, well, praise God, uh, God is giving us a, another place, a better place. You, you have to really take the information. Uh, I think two weeks ago, I had a lady come up to me and says, Pastor Jerry, I see a very large slab of rock on your back and uh, you are under such a weight. And, uh, uh, you know, sometimes prophecy can get flaky if you don't interpret properly. And I said, no, sister, that's not a slab of rock. That's a gigantic papaya that's on my back and it's for sharing and we're going to have a great a feast of the fruits of the Lord. So I, I pray that every single, even scripture can be misinterpreted and twisted in the wrong way. We really need to, uh, we really do need to, um, we really do need to interpret uh, uh, carefully uh, words that we receive and, and even reports that we receive. There's a verse that says, whose report will, will you will you believe? And uh, uh, in, in, in terms of my, my own health and uh, the pains that I'm feeling, I believe God is giving me new knees without having to do any surgery. I believe God is, is giving me new strength for the next 30 years. We've, we've finished already 30, 31 years in the church, and I believe God is giving us new strength, and uh, we will uh, renew our strength as an eagle, and we will run and not be weary. We will walk and not faint, and, and at times he will allow us to mount up with wings as eagles. So I want to pray. I want to thank uh, uh, Professor Yeo and, and, and Sui Ping, Dr. Uh, Professor Sui Ping as well for coming. Um, I believe there's more. It's, it, you know, it's very hard to uh, judge a person by one sermon. Uh, sometimes it takes two or three years. We've been trying to understand Chan V for about three years now. <laughs> and uh, uh, I'm, I'm having Paul over for lunch, uh, and I'm, I'm trying to understand his new uh, family, 360 Wall. It's a meta curriculum for King's College as well as for ICAS. There are some really gems and uh, fountains of wealth. And, and I really appreciate also the professional career of uh, Sui Ping and all the very interesting um, uh, inventions and discoveries that he has been uh, uncovering over the years that has uh, direct uh, relations to, to, to the peace of the nations. So let me just pray and uh, we'll, we can uh, move on to the communion section. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I, I ask you, Lord, as it is your will to transfer uh, more, even yet more wisdom and understanding into your kingdom. And we, your sons and daughters, will manage it for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Shalom. Testing. Okay, so um, now we will invite everyone to do a Holy Communion to the table of the Lord. Hello, do you want Holy Communion?
You want the cup? Yeah. You must uh, take a take a small one. Hold carefully, don't spill. <laughs> um, let's see the declaration together. I have a new way of living. I have a new life divine. I have the fruit of the spirit. I'm abiding, abiding in the vine. Abiding in the vine, abiding in the vine. Love, joy, health, peace, he has made them mine. I have authority, power, and victory. I'm abiding, abiding in the vine. Lord, if there be any fault in me, show me. But if not, bless me, and I will never be the same again. In your name, I cast out demons. In your name, I speak with new tongues. In your name, I pick up serpents, and if I drink any deadly poison, it shall not harm me. In your name, I lay my hands on the sick, and they shall recover, and they will never be the same again. Jesus, take me as I am. I can come no other way. Take me deeper into you. Make my flesh life melt away. Make me like a precious stone, crystal clear and finely honed. Life of Jesus shining through, giving glory back to you. Um, let's take the, the elements. Let's see the Shema together. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Baruch Shem Tevo, Malchudo, Leolam Ba. Hear, O Israel, Adonai is our God, Adonai is one. Blessed is the name of his glorious kingdom for all eternity. Let's uh, stretch our hands and pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Adonai bless you and keep you. Adonai cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Adonai lift up his 